start the program, please join me in reciting your words from uh, the opening chapter of uh, the Holy Book. This is not upon your name. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Malik, Al-Din, Iyya, Ben-Abudu, Iyya, Ben-Astayn, Ehdina, Sirat, Al-Mustafim, Sirat, Al-Mudina, Al-Amta, Al-Ayyim, Ghayr, Al-Mahdubi, Al-Ayyim, 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 A lot of people have drawn parallel with the opening chapter of the Quran, with the Lord's Prayer. And there is a lot in common between the Lord's Prayer and the opening chapter, which is short. Uh, of, of the Quran. So, anyway, welcome. <clears throat> I knew none of you had anything to do on Father's Day. You are here. <laughs> and uh, we are grateful. Um, just, um, uh, I guess, for uh, Peggy and uh, Steve, um, our Sunday uh, lectures here, uh, usually the uh, attendance goes down during the seven months. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we lose in quantity, we gain in quality. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and our lectures uh, are not limited to only religious topics. Uh, we open it up. Uh, like uh, Steve has lectured here on some of his adventures. Uh, not on Sunday, but we used to have a visiting scholars program where we invited scholars from different walks of life to talk about uh, their field of interest, and we have had uh, many over the years. So, uh, but we do have, uh, after the fourth Sunday, it's typical fourth Sunday, we have one or two topics which are of religious nature, and the others are something of general interest, and uh, really, people have taken note and interest in those general topics. So uh, we have one last one next week, uh, and I'm going to give that, uh, I'm going to take all of you uh, through a journey, on a journey, through many of the institutions that I was privileged to attend, and some of the teachers. Uh, the teachers have left an indelible mark to do on all of us in a way, but I'll share with you part of the journey that will be next Sunday uh, at the same time. So, uh, <clears throat> Steve Pollock uh, was the outdoors editor of the play, uh, and many of you uh, know his work, and uh, I uh, was privileged to get to know him early on when I came back to Toledo, and we I uh, used to talk a lot about his uh, exploits, other than his columns, which were fantastic. He also was a true outdoors man. Imagine, in the dead of winter, in the dead of winter, he went to a small cabin in Michigan, in an area which was totally uninhibited. And how many days did he spend? 17. 17 days, yeah. He came Lord back, <laughs> his, uh, his, his uh, bill for his psychiatrist went up. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine <clears throat> a person spending 17 days, no contact with anybody, carrying the food uh, himself, and in a cabin which, uh, what Steve told me was that you hear every little noise and creak uh, of this cabin. Uh, I think that was a wonderful uh, article that he wrote on his experience. He also uh, wrote a great article on uh, canoeing from Indiana in the beginning and the origin of the uh, uh, Maumee River down to Lake Erie. And it was not merely an adventure journey it was also to study the river and what was happening on the banks of that river. And that was eye-opening for many of us today. So Steve has uh, retired, uh, still active. Uh, he has uh, educated uh, a few generations 
of three rooms in the outdoors. Uh, his, uh, he is a member of the very prestigious international organization called the Explorers Club. And you always want to have the long coattails of somebody to help you get somewhere. So he recommended me to the Explorers Club. <laughs> <laughs> and because of his effort and the effort of uh, uh, Rudy, Philip <laughs> Rudy, who was a boatsman in Toledo, uh, I was admitted to that club based on my Indus uh, River expeditions. So, this topic that he is going to address today is um, uh, wonderful uh, in the sense that. Uh, we, all of us, are consumers of plastic every day. Now, when you read the newspaper, you know that it will eventually um, biologically degrade. Food we eat biologically degrades. Um, but there's certain stuff uh, that is stubborn and they don't go away. And the plastic is one of them. And it's causing havoc not only for the environment, but for the uh, bodies of water, our oceans, and the animals which live in oceans. For them. And now recently, in the past three or four years, uh, we have noticed that even though the product does not, the plastic does not degrade, it does not degrade, but it breaks down into small, tiny particles, microscopic particles. And now that is coming in the human chain. So with that backdrop, Steve? Thank you very much. Could we doubt just this first point of light? No, we will. Oh, okay. yeah. Please. Thank you. Okay. Did you turn around? Yeah. Set the time. There we are. And warmed up. Okay. I, I once was accused of being able to call a friend in Bowling Green without using a telephone because I have a rather booming voice, so I hope I don't hurt any of your ears. <laughs> Thank you for very much for having me. I, I'm honored to be here, and uh, as always, honored to have Anja for a close friend. So, plastics is a plastic term. Plastics, in a chemical sense, exist naturally. Technically, they are organic materials made of long, repeating chains of molecules. Think of a bicycle chain, one link connected to, but just like the next. Think rubber or wood, cellulose. Both are composed of repeating different chemical chains. But our concern here narrows to the era since 1907, when a Belgian-American named Leo Bakeland gave the world Bakelite, a material made from phenols, which are acids derived from coal tar. Bakelite, the stuff molded into old-fashioned radio cases and telephones and knobs, launched the era of synthetic plastics, and it took off like a by 1929, chemists had developed polystyrene, then polyester, 1940, and in between, polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, 1933, polyethylene, 1933 also, and nylon, nylon, 1935. In 1941, it was PET, polyethylene terephthalate, say that three times fast, and think carbonated drink bottles now capable now uh, capable of withstanding two atmospheres of fizz or winter gloves plastic wrapping around bouquets goes on almost endlessly today we have hundreds of thousands of polymers most with unpronounceable tongue twisting names more easily described by initials as we have already seen world war ii really lit the organic chemical fire under plastics development. 
plastics were developed for and used in everything from military vehicle components to radar insulation. Then suddenly the war was over. What to do with all the masses of plastic making machinery? Clever profit seeking marketers lost no time conjuring a consumer goods market. Witness Tupperware, 1948, year I was born, 75 years old, and so much more. Light, durable, they last and last. Perhaps thousands of years in a landfill in some form or anywhere else. One study showed that more than 9.1 billion tons of plastic have been made since 1950, and 7 billion tons are no longer in use. Where did it all go? That's our subject. I call your attention now to an image which is a sculpture of an 82-foot blue whale, the world's largest creature made of what else? Plastic trash, the kind that ends up in our oceans. It was originally uh, commissioned several years ago by the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, and pithily is named ethyl after the ubiqu ubiquitous organic chemical radical that is part and parcel of so much plastic. Ethyl uh, uh, will be, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this, the, the makers of ethyl spent more than five months hand recycling and, and molding 4,000 pounds of trash uh, and melding it into usable pieces. The inspiration for the whale sculpture is that every nine minutes, 300,000 pounds, about the weight of a blue whale, the world's largest mammal ends up in the ocean, which brings us to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, an area about twice the size of the state of Texas in the Pacific Ocean between Hawaii and California. It was first seen in the mid-1980s, even though much of it you cannot see from the air. More about that in a bit. Just about the same time in the mid-1980s, it was also noted that whales were dying, their guts often clogged with plastics, and worldwide beaches were seen to be knee-deep in plastics trash. Jenna Jombeck, an environmental engineer at the University of Georgia, published a research paper in 1915, or 2015, that showed that hundreds of thousands of times more plastic were washing into the oceans than people were seeing in these ocean years. There are six of them, all of them being circulating currents that concentrate stuff like plastic in their giant whirlpool vortices. John Beck likes to have interviewers and listeners or audiences engage in an exercise to write down everything that they can think of that, is, that they touch or use that's plastic across a period of 24 hours. I'll start with my plastic contact lenses. Beautiful little wisps that allow me, though I am profoundly nearsighted, to see like a hawk at a distance. But then also my little drugstore cheaters. All plastic, the lenses and the frames. I have plastic filling, ultraviolet hardened, in my jaw from a dental procedure. My new knees, though titanium based, have polyethylene covers to help them glide and lubricate. Let's pretend, and think about this, you know, buttons, you know, my tie, whatever. You know, it, it's everywhere we touch. These, these cursed devices that we become slaves to. Let's pretend we're at a, at a landfill. You know, the countrysides are now dotted with these man-made mittens, gigantic mounds with all those little white plastic pipes, gas relief vents sticking up from them. I call them our true national symbols, Mount Trashborn. They are so common, we may not even notice them anymore, like the plastic trash 
filled up so much of them. The organic garbage in a landfill relatively is quickly decayed, broken down into constituent chemicals by microbes. Metals corrode and dissolve, even aluminum over a couple centuries, few centuries. But plastics, toothpaste tubes, PVC pipe, water bottles, chip bags, you name it. Over time, yes, they will break down, but only in the smaller pieces of plastic. How long they will remain plastic is not a question that we have not been able yet to reliably answer. But think in hundreds or thousands of years and you'll be in the ballpark. Some other considerations. Oop, there was a landfill. Missed that slide, sorry. You, but you get it. Balloon releases once were, though less so now, uh, were close to home and have had a wide impact on litter and pollution. Several years ago, uh, Clemson University was finally made to see the light and quit the tradition of releasing 10,000 latex balloons each football game. And those balloons, by the way, use helium, a non-renewable resource. Once the Earth's helium is gone, it's gone. We're not going to make any more. And the streams on the wayward balloons, often made out of Kevlar, will drape across power lines and cause outages. Balloons join plastic straws and grocery bags, for instance, among items now that are properly in the crosshairs of environmental snipers. They can kill seabirds and turtles, for example, but think they are eating edible jellyfish. Let's return to the uh, uh, plastic or the Great Pacific garbage patch. It covers 620,000 square miles, about 14 times the size of the state of Ohio. Contains at least 90,000 tons of plastic in 1.8 trillion, with a T, pieces. 92% of those pieces, just a fifth of an inch in diameter. That's why you can't see so much of the mass from the air, just a fifth of an inch in diameter. That one slide I had was kind of a just a visual boost. For starters, here's a good piece of common sense. If the bathtub is overflowing, the first thing you do is not to start bailing, turn off the faucet. The flip side is if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. As much as we rightly emphasize controlling plastic waste here in North America, know that the biggest problems, more than half the plastic waste globally, flows down just a dozen rivers in 12 Asian and African countries. China at 28%, Indonesia 10%, the Philippines and Vietnam at 6% each alone account for half of these rivers and, and the problem. By comparison, the United States contributes less than a per one percent annually, but its global reach, its global reach, indirectly generates this plastic overseas. We'll get to this momentarily. All the four, foregoing countries uh, have growing consumer economies, but mechanisms for controlling uh, that waste output are lacking. They resemble, in a way, America 50, 60, 100 years ago. Uh, one of my uh, wonderful naturalist predecessors here, Lou Campbell, equivalent to Lou Clure, that the two Lou's were, were the great uh, outdoor writers of the early 19th century. He once told me a story how in the 20s, when he was just a young man, he challenged the mayor of Toledo about the Guami River flowing black past downtown. And the mayor said, son, that's the sign of progress. <laughs> <laughs> and Lou told me he loved to tell that story. He was a wonderful man. Uh, in 2010, it was estimated uh, 9 million tons of plastics were washing into our oceans. That, that is the equivalent to five grocery bags of plastic stacked every foot along every coastal beach in the world. 
Much beach trash, moreover, is composed of cigarette butts, which have a plastic base with the cellulose, grocery bags, bottles, and caps, straws, utensils, packaging, you name it. Oh, these were the, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not coordinating well. These are some of the, you can barely see the world map, but you can see the big circles are the, 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 the problem areas for this. It is now estimated that 40% of packaging or our is plastic. Or no, wait, it is estimated that packaging now can, can constitutes 40% of plastic use. A dump truck load every minute into our oceans. The developing countries are big contributors to the ocean plastics waste stream, but they lack garbage collection systems, modern landfills, and incinerators. But that does not absolve us, the Western consumer societies, which have driven the whole system from day one. A bemusing inc incident illustrates how pervasive that influence has been. It's the case of the Garfield plastic telephone. It turns out that a shipping container full of these toy Garfield the Cat tellies fell off a container ship and ended up off the coast of France, eventually washing up into a coastal cave and breaking up. With each high tide and low tide, outwashed thousands and thousands of these telly cats, and they showed up all over the beaches in Europe. So, remedies. How can we address the crisis? China, in 2018, Stop accepting recyclable plastic waste from overseas. And after all, all, all other politics aside, why should it? As the sage H.L. Mencken once said, for every complex human problem, there is a solution that is neat, simple, and wrong. The same thing happens. China, for instance, which has obviously a, a very instant way of getting things done rather than we who cannot agree on lunch here uh, prohibited plastic bags among retailers it had no effect on plastic bag pollution solutions are foreign they're expensive yet necessary yet we can improve track, uh, trash collection uh, if we could boost trash trash collection in the the five uh, nations that I mentioned, the Asian nations I mentioned, by 80%, we could reduce uh, ocean plastics by 23% in 10 years, which would be a good start. But that would be at a cost of four to five billion dollars or more a year. It is suggested that nations that benefit from the product, products of the plastic waste nations earmark foreign aid uh, for trash collection systems. That is not very sexy politically. As you can see, this problem is going to take a long time, determination, and money to fix. Big business might be cajoled into playing along too in such nations as India and Indonesia, where 3M, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, and the like are well ensconced. Petroleum companies and plastics producers also should get into the act you own stock in such companies? You have a voice. You can write letters, start campaigns. Business is very, very sensitive to the shame game. They don't want to be in the headlines with negative publicity like that. Uh, I have uh, an, uh, an article here by uh, Boyan Slat uh, from the New York Times. He was the founder and chief executive of Ocean Cleanup. and, and uh, in it, uh, I'll, I'll quickly summarize first, uh, Ocean Cleanup is an organization that spent more than $35 million to corral plastic litter in the Pacific garbage patch using sophisticated booms more than a half mile long. The first trial boom was towed to sea in uh, 2019 between California and Hawaii, and they ran in, no surprise, with a startup uh, ran into a series of problems. They brought them back to their home port, California, and re-engineered it, and uh, uh, went to uh, uh, several, through several iterations, 
and they're finally uh, they're finally getting uh, getting the, the act together. But even uh, Boyd Slack, the founder of Ocean Cleanup, admits that their best efforts are only at this point uh, going to reach uh, so far have only reached about 0.2 percent of the waste that's out there. The long-term goal is to work over 20 years with a fleet of these booms and vessels towing them to, uh, to, to uh, clean up about 90 percent of the garbage cats. Very, very ambitious uh, and uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, and I wish them luck. There's a, a, another uh, aspect to this, and I, I've alluded to it a couple times, and I'm just mentioned it, microplastics. Oh, this is a, uh, going back quickly to the boom, uh, this is a boom in the Los Angeles River. They're even, this is a, uh, another technique they're using to scoop up plastic before it gets to the ocean, but again, expensive, and we pay for it. Uh, microplastics, uh, they break down, plastic break down into very small, tiny pieces. And here's an interesting note from a, an article that uh, appeared in National Public Radio called Beer, Drinking Water, and Fish. Tiny plastic is everywhere. And they noted that about 15 years ago, researchers started paying a lot of attention to microplastics. But they're in oceans, rivers, and lakes. They're also found in soil. And a recent re recent research in Germany found that fertilizer made from composted household waste contained microplastics. And even more concerning, they found microplastics in drinking water, beer, sea salt, fish, and shellfish. Which brings me to a little uh, uh, an article in uh, the Washington Post talks about recycling and, and unanticipated problems. Uh, recycling, the machinery grinds up and adds to the microplastics problem. And the, the article is, is rather extensive and it's uh, way too time consuming to do now. Uh, I once had, had asked, was asked to do this lecture across a two hour time period and I would have gotten down into those weeds, but you get the point. Uh, the, the, the gist of that article is that, uh, yes, microplastics are a, a problem that, that are a, a tangential or, but a, or a byproduct of recycling plastic, but we should not stop recycling plastics because of that. We need to keep moving on. And uh, world, only about 9% of our plastic are actually recycled uh, worldwide. About five to six percent in the United States, the rest ends up in the landfill, even though we are going to the trouble of putting plastic in the bin and so on and so on. Uh, the, the, the system is still inefficient, but uh, again, everybody that's involved in it says, don't stop. Let's keep the mindset going. Fifty years ago, nobody thought of recycling anything. At least it's in people's minds now. Even now, when you go to a restaurant and they serve, serve a, a, a straw with, with your water glass, often now they ask, do you want a straw? Five, six years ago, you just got a straw all the time whether you wanted it or not. So these learning curves are, are, are happening, but boy, they seem painfully slow. Acrylic, nylon, spandex, polyester fibers from clothes washing constitute 99% of the microplastics collected in three Great Lakes rivers, according to a research study by Loyola University, the Muskegon, St. Joseph, and Milwaukee rivers. They picked those three rivers because one was rural and wooded, one was agricultural, and one had a rural urban mix. I never thought of this until researching that a single fleece jacket washed will shed 1,900 uh, plastic fibers. 88% of fish samples had microplastics in their digestive systems, and 93% of us test positive for BPA plastic used in food and water containers. 
so it's in us. Micros, microplastics are thought to absorb pesticides and industrial chemicals, again more acronyms, PAHs and PCBs, UV stabilizers, flame retardants among them. 24 German beers made from local fresh water supplies were found to contain microfibers. So uh, human ingestion of microplastic is almost certain nowadays, even in, it's in oysters, mussels, some fish, there, you can find them in Lake Erie walleye. There it is, but it's in us now already. Uh, so how to solve this? Yes, we can develop uh, special filters for washing machines to capture microfibers. We can do more beverage container recycling and make it stick. We can crack down on littering. Get cigarette butts by count are the most numerous litter on beaches. Uh, the Kroger Company, uh, the huge grocery chain with many names across the country, 2,700 different stores, said this was two, two years, three years ago, that it was working to reduce and divert 90% of its waste from a landfill by 2020. Uh, there, that's an interesting story that, that I'll get that I'll circle back to momentarily. Starbucks also uh, uh, talked about eliminating plastic straws, Marriott International, and so forth. Uh, California went into a instant uh, single-use plastic uh, carryout bag statewide ban. Australia, same way, plastic bag ban, uh, and much more. But the problem is. Uh, there's also plastic in cosmetics, scrub beads, fishing lines, foam, uh, and, and wrappers, and so much more. Just just think of, of all the different stuff on their list. Is there such a thing as biodegradable plastic that will go away? Perhaps. Think polylactic acid along bicycle chain of sugar molecules der derived from cornstarch closely related to cornflakes. It can be used to make degradable plastic bags, clothing fibers, and much more. It can be formulated into cellophane and rayon. In the same vein, sugar cane is used in Brazil to make PET bottles for Pepsi. Ultimately, it is said, it is the profit mode that will drive development of more and better biodegradable plastics. It all turns on the price of a barrel of crude oil, which is the feedstock for making synthetic plastics. When oil grows dear enough, monetarily, the synthetic plastics era may well enter a biosynthetic age. It will not be tomorrow, which is why we here are worried about drowning in plastic waste everywhere. But there is some hope on the biodegradability front. Uh, a new study uh, uh, or, uh, had, had a, uh, a, came up with a surprise bacterium. Uh, in 2016, uh, it was discovered in a Japanese waste dump, and it had evolved to, to use polyethylene terephthalate, PET, commonly used in a million soft drink bottles sold every minute around the world as an energy source. The team of scientists originally began running, to, running tests to see how the bacterium Idionella sakinensis, sakinensis uh, managed to produce an enzyme capable of degrading PET. These tests, it turned out, inadvertently made the enzyme PETase even better at degrading PET. The resultant mutant PETase now just takes a few days to break down PET compared to 450 years for it to break down naturally. The original bacterium is far from the first living species capable of plastic eating proclivities. Waxworm caterpillars have, found, have been found to break down plastics, some plastics, in a matter of hours, and mealworms possess gut microbes that eat through polystyrene. Uh, it is 
thought that it is likely that microbes are evolving faster and better strategies to break down man-made plastics. But again, more and more research is needed. Here's an interesting recent little article that, that I will read to you. Researchers, because uh, it's brief, researchers of Princeton Engineering have found a way to turn your breakfast spoon into a new material that can cheaply remove microplastics from our oceans. Microplastics uh, can find their way into our food and water. We, okay, we know that it's estimated there's more than 24 trillion with a T pieces in the ocean. Using regular store-bought egg whites, the team at Princeton created an aerogel, which is a lightweight material that can be used for water filtration, energy storage, and thermal insulation. The idea for this process came during lunch as Craig Arnold, the Vice Dean of Innovation at Princeton, was eating a sandwich. He said, I was sitting there staring at the bread in my sandwich and I thought to myself, this is the exact kind of structure that we need. So he set his team to work asking them to replicate the aerogel structure that he had in mind by mixing carbon with a variety of bread recipes. The group continued to take away ingredients through its tests until only egg whites remained. The egg whites are more complicated than they may seem and can be transferred into interconnected strands of carbon fibers and sheets of graphene, an ultra-thin compound that can be turned into graphite. In a paper published in Materials Today, uh, Ar uh, Arnold and his colleagues showed that the resulting material can remove salt and microplastics from seawater with 98 and 99% efficiency, respectively. The resulting dead weight material is inexpensive to produce, energy efficient, and highly effective. One of the paper's authors said, uh, noted that activated carbon is one of the cheapest materials used in water purification. We compared our results with activated carbon and it's much better. Of course, now it's proven on the test bench, scaling it up and getting the political will to pay for the scale up is the big $64 question. Uh, I wanna circle back here to Kroger. Uh, back uh, a few years ago, uh, in 2018, uh, they uh, wanted to uh, phase out uh, plastic bags and uh, 380 billion plastic bags are used in this country every year and obviously we know you, you can see them stuck on corn stalks in the farm fields in the winter they're, they're everywhere in the, the oceans and so on but the problem with replacing plastic plastic bags uh, say a cotton reusable grocery bag back in Kroger started pushing these in 2018. You go to Kroger's now, they're back to plastic bags. Mm -hmm. Clearly, that push didn't work. And the reason was, uh, it was demonstrated that to, to uh, come up with an equivalent, an environmental uh, equivalency between the reusable cotton plastic bag and a, or a cotton bag and a plastic bag, you would have to use the, the uh, cotton grocery bag 7,100 times before you would end up with an equivalency with single-use plastic bags, which is why we don't see them now. And think about it, 7,100 times. If you use that plastic bag to carry your groceries once a week, you have to do it for 142 years to come up. I did the math, and I think I was right on it. Uh, to to uh, to come up with the equivalency. So that's why we're back to plastic bags. At least now Kroger, at least my Kroger, they have big bins where you can take these plastic bags back and I hope they put some good use to them rather than just take them to the trash. So uh, that that's this these are the this is some of the egg white uh, work. Just an, another track. This is uh, this is what we're we're up against uh, uh, drift nets gone wild uh, in the ocean, you know, killing uh, sea turtles and so forth and so on. 
And what I would like to finish with is a nice little cartoon summary, if you will. Thanks. 
Pence and the Trump. <clears throat> While all of this is tragic and makes for great magazine covers, there's even more widespread invisible form of plastic. Microplastics. Microplastics are pieces smaller than five centimeters. Some are only used in cosmetics or toothpaste, but most result from floating waste that is constantly exposed to UV radiation and crumbles into smaller and smaller pieces. 51 trillion such particles float in the ocean where they are even more easily swallowed by all kinds of marine life. This has raised concerns among scientists, especially about health risks from the chemical for the added plastic. BPA, for example, makes plastic bottles transparent, but there's also evidence that it interferes with our hormonal system. DEHP makes plastics more flexible, but may cause cancer. It would be pretty bad if microplastics are toxic, because they travel up the food chain. Zooplankton eat microplastic. Small fish eat zooplankton. So do oysters, crabs, and predatory fish. And they all land on our plate. Microplastics have been found in honey, in sea salt, in beer, in tap water, and in the household dust around us. Eight out of ten babies and nearly all adults have measurable amounts of phthalates, a common plastic additive, in their bodies. And 93% of people have BPA in their urine. There is little science about this so far, and right now it's inconclusive. We need a lot more research before panic is justified. But it is safe to say that a lot of stuff happened that we didn't plan for, and we have lost control of the plastic to a certain extent, which is kind of scary. But just to make sure, we should simply ban plastics, right? Unfortunately, it's a bit more complicated than that. Plastic pollution is not the only environmental challenge we face. Some of the substitutes we use for plastic have a higher environmental impact in other ways. For example, According to a recent study by the Danish government, making a single-use plastic bag requires so little energy and produces far lower carbon dioxide emissions compared to a reused cotton bag that you need to use your cotton bag 7,100 times before it would have a lower impact on the environment than the plastic bag. We're left with a complex process of trade-offs. Everything has an impact somehow, and it's hard to find the right balance between them. Plastic also helps solve problems that we don't have very good answers for at the moment. Globally, one third of all food that's produced is never eaten and ends up rotting away on landfills where it produces methane. And the best way of preventing food from spoiling and avoiding unnecessary waste is still plastic packaging. It's also important to know where the vast majority of the world's plastic pollution is coming from right now. 90% of all plastic waste entering the ocean through rivers comes from just 10 rivers in Asia and Africa. The Yangtze in China alone flushes 1.5 million tons of plastic into the ocean each year. Countries like China, India, Algeria, or Indonesia, and... Oh. Sorry about that. Well, that, it was almost to the end. It was almost to the end, and uh, I, I bumped the wrong thing. But at any rate, uh, uh, this was this little cartoon, and I can give you the uh, the YouTube reference for it if you want to revisit it sometime or share it with others. Uh, is a good summary of, of everything else that I've uh, uh, described in this lecture, although uh, not in quite the detail. But the, it, it's a nice thread. Uh, that's uh, marks the end of what I have, uh, and uh, I'm open to questions or uh, whatever. It's a clip in there. Mm -hmm. Sure. Excellent, excellent lecture. Uh, there are a few things that I think society has to take responsibility. Sorry. A few things that society, as you indicated, has to take responsibility. Uh, there is a, an ad used to run some time ago in one of the chemical companies where they asked somebody to go to a house and they said, take everything out which contain plastic. We ended up with just wood shell. 
and, and that is the truth because even as we stand uh, we become naked if we were to ask take everything on you which has plastic in it and now unfortunately the word plastic is such a, a name that really uh, with the current uh, society imp implies a lot of negative things but um, for example um, we really should drive with white lines in the highway that is probably a major source of microplastic than the one in the ocean. Absolutely. The other thing that we use daily is rubber tires. And rubber tires are constantly uh, grinding with the, with the, with the lamp. And therefore, the rubber tire degrades with time. Turns out, those are really major sources of microplastic, more so than because micro implies on the scale of micron. And the micron is really you cannot see. Uh, so the other point is that there are still remnants of the literature which contains BPA. As you know, this is about 50 years ago they attempted to make baby jars, baby food jars, which made it out of that chemical, but it has been prohibited now for over 40, 50 years. But it still makes it. The plastic bottles contain zero TV. But when I listen to the news, especially on TV, they always carry the water bottle and they always imply TBA. Because I think it's an easy thing to, to say that. But it, 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 it. yes, the other, I think the main point uh, related to the plastic use versus any other component is one has to look what the major effect on humanity. And the major effect in humanity these days is really the question of global warming and alike. So then, as you, as you said, it takes effort, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of commitment. But the industry these days uh, is trying to use the word reduce and recycle. What is the new technology now is, as you indicated, there are discoveries of enzymes that they can accelerate the breaking down of that PET you mentioned into the main component, which is terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. So, if that is get repeated, then it would be get the, the, the new source of the plastic to be used. Now, the effect on the environment in doing a, a paper bag versus plastic bag, the contribution to the environment of the paper is roughly 10 times higher. Because you can imagine, you have to grow a forest, you have to cut the trees, and then converting cellulose to paper use, there is the use of a lot of uh, exotic materials such as acids. And it, so if you take all of that into account, what is driving now the technology is really the total cycle life analysis. And that is that scale is what is the contribution to the environment where the threat is a is global threat of humanity's existence. The one point I'd like to mention also is the word biodegradable. You have to understand that biodegradable 
is not really a practical way for doing packaging. Because if it is biodegradable, it means it is subject to contact with the environment. So you can imagine if, well, let's say we have uh, some kind of container, whether it's soft drink or food, subjected to some environment where some bacteria is there. All it takes is one case in the United States, and that will be for them forever. The other point is that if we make a plastic from bio-based sources such as you can take, as you mentioned, uh, corn and convert it to sugar into component of ethylene glycol, and you can take cellulose, break it down into terephthalic acid. Yet these are bio-sourced. Once you make the PET, the PET itself are no more biodegradable. So there are limited number of plastics which are naturally biodegradable. PPE mentioned a, 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 I saw it as the name, but anyway, so very few, but they are not usable, really beneficial for, uh, they, they are good for paper uh, plates where the use is limited, but it, you cannot store food in them because they are subject to the environment. But excellent lecture, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, it was very, very enlightening. A uh, quick question about that, I don't know whether it's called boom technology, but that 0.2% effect that they've had, could you just elaborate on, on the system or the method by which they've had that effect? Where they were, the, the booms? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah there's uh, uh, this outfit, this outfit uh, ocean cleanup that was founded by this Danish uh, entrepreneur. Uh, they started out with the idea that they would put booms out at sea, out in this garbage patch, and, and drag the booms through, and then and then they would collect the plastic that the, that the, the booms uh, uh, gathered up. They ran into all, I mean, the ocean has its own will, and you know, with storms and everything, they, they went through a long trial period as a startup, as to how to do this. And they started out with a, for instance, a single boat or ship with with a, a circular boom around it. And now they've gone to a, a two ship system with one towing each end of a boom. They, they've redesigned the booms to be much more effective. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I hope they, you know, it would be, it would be nice to, uh, to see them succeed in, uh, in in corralling this, uh, it's it's quite a it's quite a problem. But again, it's it's only the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. There's an Atlantic Garbage Patch too, and an Indian Ocean Garbage Patch, and a Southern Ocean Garbage Patch, as you saw. Uh, but uh, the the principles are the same. Uh, if they if the current generation of their technology. Is is up to the test. Uh, that they, they may be able to corral ninety percent of the plastic in the garbage patch in the next twenty years, if there's if they can raise the money to pay for the work. What happens and, after they corral it? Oh, they 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 put it on on barges and take it back to the mainland to recycle it uh, and reuse it. Uh, that's that's the idea. Uh, I hope they don't make more Mount Trashmores. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. Welcome. So, uh, before I conclude, <clears throat> uh, there is lunch downstairs, courtesy of Al Hayalis.
and please join us for lunch. <clears throat> We're going to stop here uh, and I will give present a watercolor of Islamic Center of Toledo oh, to Steve. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's yeah. nice. so, we are, uh, I'm joking, uh, we are undergoing some hard economic times. So we did not frame it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm honored. I, I, I've made so many wonderful friends here over the years, and I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you so, so much. So what's going to happen now? You wanted now? to say that there was a plastic frame, and you had to oh, 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 that's, oh, that's, oh, that's a that's good one. <laughs> we are going to conclude this part. We will have about 10 minute uh, early afternoon prayer service will take about seven minutes at the most and then we will have lunch downstairs but those of you who are not staying for the service please help uh, our guests go down to the cafeteria okay well thank you very much and don't forget